Welcome to Showcase. Today, the Art Lords of Afghanistan, Dior Models 2 White and 12 Punto. Artists are taking up their brushes against Afghanistan's bad guys. Dior faces a diversity problem, but is its response sufficient? And a screenplay event aims to give a boost to Turkey's movie productions. Two years ago, we told you the story of art lords, the Afghan artists who use the walls of Kabul as their canvas. Well, they've been busier than ever. We'll talk to their founder in just a minute, but first, here's Zainab. They started their journey in 2014 by bringing color to these blast walls surrounding the Afghan capital. Since then, the Art Lords movement, a wordplay on the many warlords and drug lords in the country, has grown bigger and even crossed borders. Last year, they adorned the walls of the Swiss town of Lugano, alongside dozens of its residents, during a trip aimed at exchanging ideas on arts, culture and to portray a different image of Afghanistan. The group's latest effort is to start a dialogue between all ages, gender and ethnicity as part of their Let's Talk Afghanistan project. But it has always been their murals that got them this far. And although some of their works have been commissioned by UN agencies and embassies to call on action to end poverty and protecting the planet, their independent pieces are almost always aimed at stirring political debate. And they don't just tackle issues in their backyard. Last month they created this, one side pays tribute to the Afghan refugees who drowned while crossing the Iranian border, while the other side remembers George Floyd, who was killed by police officers and sparked worldwide protests for racial equality. George Floyd is a global figure now, and he was killed in the United States because of the blackness of his skin. We wanted to express our support for George Floyd with our art. There is also discrimination in Afghanistan. And with these paintings, we want to say no to discrimination, because discrimination has no benefit for us. I think it's only important to be humane and Muslim. Their work has always been a collaborative effort between Art Lords artists, volunteers and even passerbys. Together they call out corruption, injustice and other issues in the country that has been at war for almost 20 years. Kabul has been surrounded with blast walls which infuriate people, but this art has a message. It can give hope to people that if the people's lives are limited by war, through these blast walls from the other side, there's a group of people who are giving a better hope by thinking freely through this art. And all this work is paving the way for the group's long-term goals. One mural at a time, they hope to create a youth movement that holds authorities accountable for their wrongdoings, all while turning cable into the street art capital of the world. I'm now joined by the co-founder of Art Lords, Omaid Sharifi. Hi, Omaid. Thanks so much for joining us today. So, um, you say that you want to hold the authorities accountable using your art. How successful do you think you've been? Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having me on your show today. Um, we started a movement uh, for accountability and transparency. Uh, not only the government officials, the powerful people in Afghanistan, but everybody who is involved. That includes international community as well. And that started with the very simple mural. It's a pair of eyes and says, I see you. Saying that the people of Afghanistan, they know that you're stealing our money. If you're not transparent, if you're not accountable, if you're not responding to the needs and wants of the Afghan people, we know that. If we cannot take you to justice today, but maybe very soon, we can take you to justice. And being a Muslim country, Afghanistan, we all believe in Allah, in God, and God is watching us. So whatever you do, just so justice will prevail. So by having this movement, Art Lords is trying to use art as a tool to promote transparency, to promote a culture of 
uh, accountability and also put pressure on all these warlords, drug lords, powerful people who are very corrupt uh, to uh, make them accountable. Okay, so you mentioned your first mural, it's called I See You, and you were, it was aimed at questioning the corruption in the country. How successful do you think you've been in tackling that? And do you feel like you've really put the authorities to question in that sense? Our aim is to raise awareness and then do advocacy uh, about corruption in Afghanistan. As a Muslim country, we are on the top list of three most corrupt countries, according to Transparency International. And this is a big shame for me, who has lived all my life in Afghanistan. And I'm sure all the Afghan people, they are not corrupt. Corruption is not part of my culture. So to raise this voice, to make sure that we can create a platform that the Afghan people can come and paint together and say that we are not corrupt. The corrupt people are maybe this 1,000 people who are hiding themselves behind these blast walls uh, in, in, in their palaces in Afghanistan. These are the corrupt people. So for us, it was that the Afghan people, corruption should be separated from the Afghan people first. And secondly, for us, the Afghan people, to let all these powerful people know that we know you're stealing. So sort of giving a voice to the ordinary people of Afghanistan, that was our aim. And I think we really achieved our goal in making sure that people in all communities, in the villages and districts, they come together and they raise their voices, that they are fed up with the corruption which is happening at the central government, at the local government, and people are organizing now, coming together to stand up against corruption. Okay, so you think that there is now uh, progress in terms of corruption. That's lovely. So one question that, uh, you know, it's obviously great what you're doing there, you know, giving color to the city in a way. But then what I don't understand is that your relationship with the government. So obviously these blast walls are in sensitive areas and you need to get permission before uh, painting these murals, right? Right. Okay, so you are criticizing the government and authorities very harshly. Why do you think they're giving you permission to paint these murals? We have sacrificed a lot for the last 20 years for the constitution and freedom of expression that we have in Afghanistan. And I'm really proud of what we have achieved. So the Afghan constitution and, uh, and especially uh, the sec second chapter of our constitution gives me the, the, uh, the rights to express myself. Uh, so I do go to take permission for painting those walls because I'm painting in the presidential palace or the spy agency or Ministry of Defense. So these are very sensitive areas or American embassy. So I have to let them know because these are guarded towers. People with guns are sitting on them. So I don't want to be shot at because I'm just painting something. Uh, but at the same time, I have my rights to go there and express and, and criticize the government. And fortunately, uh, the government in Afghanistan is uh, tolerating it, 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 because of our rights. So the, we have this discourse and conversation that an artist, an activist, a journalist can come up, raise the questions and ask the hard questions of transparency and accountability. OK, so you feel like you're being tolerated only by the authorities. Where do you think Afghanistan is at the moment uh, when it comes to freedom of speech? Uh, if we are talking about the Constitution and the rights, we have the laws which protects freedom of expression, freedom of rights. Uh, but when it comes to the reality, uh, and the dangers involved, uh, uh, in 2018 and 2019, we have the most journalists who are killed in Afghanistan. So you have the Daesh, you have the Taliban, you have a lot of terrorist groups and warlords who are active in this country. They have guns, they are powerful, and they don't like people who are talking about their corruption, about their abuses. So in terms of the ground realities, we have to be very careful. We could be killed, we could be beaten, we could be in, 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 in their personal jails. Uh, but in terms of laws, we have the laws that protect us. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you mentioned some of the risks. Obviously, there are huge risks. Are you not afraid? How does it feel to be the co-founder of Art Lords in current-day Afghanistan? If I don't do it today, who will do it? I have lived all my life in the war. I've only seen violence, violence and conflict. Uh, so this has to stop. And what we are bringing to the table is empathy, is love, is using art 
as a tool for social change. It's changing attitudes and behaviors. It's giving happiness to the people. So I think our work and the work of all the artists in, in Afghanistan are very important because the other people, the other groups, they only bring guns and violence and they're killing people. They're doing explosions. But we are the people who are, who are healing. We're trying to give them a brush to heal themselves. So my work is as important as anybody else in that country. And I take pride that my team and we have been doing this work for the last six years and we are pushing. We consciously do this. We know the threats. We know every day is a threat. We could die any moment. But at the same time, I take this decision consciously that we have to do this right now. We have to raise our voices. We have to heal. We have to have compassion. We have to have empathy to solve our problems. Okay, were any of your murals destroyed or harmed by, uh, you know, people who didn't like what you were doing? Or were any of you or your artists harmed or injured? Uh, I can give you a couple of examples. For example, we painted a mural of uh, a human rights defender, Amida Barmaki. She and her family were all killed in an explosion in a supermarket, in a grocery store. Uh, we painted that mural in front of the house of that warlord that killed her. Uh, there is allegedly, allegedly reports that this warlord ordered the killing of uh, Amida Barmaki. So the gunman came and destroyed that mural. Or our mural at the NDS, the spy agency of Afghanistan, was uh, uh, was painted over. So there has been many cases that the government or warlords have decided uh, to remove some of the murals. Uh, but we have not stopped. If they have whitewashed it, we have gone again to paint it again. So we are continuing our efforts and our campaign uh, to raise our voices and raise our voices with the love and with, with not with the hate, but with our brushes against their guns. All right, Omaid Sharifi, I wish you the best in your journey. Thanks so much for joining us today on Showcase. As European museums reopen their doors, the financial impact of the coronavirus pandemic is lingering. But one museum in Paris has a unique lifeline. Here is Senna. Tourists and locals used to flock to the Rodin Museum in Paris. The sculpture park, for instance, attracted 570,000 people last year. But after a four-month Covid break, and France's borders still close to many foreign tourists, the museum is expecting to sell less than half the usual number of tickets this year. We do not have government subsidies apart for construction works and bigger upkeep projects. That's why the COVID-19 crisis for us will lead to significant losses financially, costing us almost $5 million, which will be partly compensated for by our other revenue sources. Home to masterpieces such as The Kiss and the Thinker, August Rodin permitted the museum to sell bronze replicas of his work. And the museum is taking advantage. This year, we have considerable resources which are down to our continuous activity of making bronze casts of original pieces, which will in part compensate for these losses. Also, we'll have access to our reserve, which has been built up for several years by resources of original editions of bronze pieces. Museums and art collectors from the US to Switzerland and from South Korea to Japan are buying the replicas, like this bronze version of the Gates of Hell. And this side hustle will have to keep the museum in the black for the foreseeable future. We worry because we know that we won't return to normal next year. We know that the year 2021 will be difficult and with my colleagues we project the normal situation will return only after two or three years. So of course, we'll have several difficult years ahead. So the museum won't be striking gold anytime soon. But in a French economy where a tech CEO is actually pitching the idea to sell the Mona Lisa, at least the Rodin Museum has some bronze to back it up. Well, let's find out what else is going on with the arts and culture scene. The European Fine Art Fair has cancelled its New York edition due to the coronavirus pandemic. 
The event has been postponed to October, but Art News reports that several factors, including travel restrictions, limitations on space, and uncertainties surrounding health and safety, made the event impossible to hold this year. TIFAF has had a number of cancellations and postponements that affected their marquee event in the Netherlands and also pushed up next year's schedule. The artist Bridget Berlin, one of Andy Warhol's closest confidants, has died at the age of 80. Berlin was a socialite in the New York art scene in the 60s and 70s. She acted in several Warhol films. She also participated in a prank with Warhol, falsely confirming that she was the actual artist behind all of his works. The joke led to a drop in the price of Warhol paintings. Members of the band Linkin Park have sent a cease and desist letter to US President Donald Trump. Trump retweeted a campaign video using the band's song in the end. Linkin Park said it never gave permission and Twitter took the video down. Trump has faced similar complaints and legal action from a number of bands, including the Beatles, Nickelback, Queen and Rihanna. Luxury fashion brands are trying to find new ways to adapt to the pandemic. Two weeks ago, we saw Dior's come out with a film showcasing their haute couture collection. However, critics pounced on it, accusing the company for having a lack of diversity. The fight for equality and for diversity has been a long journey in society and in the fashion industry. This was how Naomi Campbell opened the first digital Paris haute couture week. She stressed the need for action to create a diverse and inclusive fashion industry in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement. However, the digital fashion show wasn't as diverse as expected. Dior was criticized for using only white models, which some thought inspired this response. A week later, the artistic director of menswear, Kim Jones, surprised the fashion world by featuring only black models at Dior's 2021 Men's Summer Show. The collection, titled Portrait of an Artist, has been described as a celebration of identity. But Jones told The Guardian it wasn't political and that the project began back in December. And African art is something that's always been important to me. Jones not only cast black models, but he collaborated with the acclaimed Ghanaian painter Amalko Balfo. The flick tells the story of the artist as well as showcases new clothes inspired by his finger painting technique. So, with a new kind of fashion presentation may give room for a new brand of diversity, unless a return to the catwalk one day means business as usual. Billy Wilder was already considered a Hollywood visionary when he made The Apartment. But with his black and white classic, the émigré auteur raised the bar even higher 60 years ago. Operator, I want White Plains, New York, Mr. J.D. Sheldrake. 1950s Hollywood is described by scholars as a period of repression. Movies examining male and female relationships, be them dramas or romantic comedies, were especially under watch for possible offensive content. Yet, Austrian director Billy Wilder was bent on breaking the norms with Sabrina in Love in the Afternoon. But in the words of rom-com director Cameron Crowe, Wilder's most defining movie waited for the 1960s to come along. The Apartment tells the story of an insurance clerk. C.C. Baxter, played by Jack Lemmon, who climbs up the company ladder as he keeps lending his apartment to his bosses for their extramarital affairs. Along the way, Baxter falls in love with his boss's mistress, Frank Kubelik, played by Shirley MacLaine. At the time, the norm in Hollywood was to convey these kinds of topics through suggestion. But with the apartment, Billy Wilder abandoned this kind of symbolism and donned a direct approach to create a study on the complicated nature of having a taboo relationship. In a bittersweet performance by Jack Lemmon and the ironic humor of Shirley MacLaine gave the film a modern quality. And due to the star power of the film's leads, this kind of modern tackling of the subject became a hit with the audiences, something that was lacking in similar Hollywood movie fare. 
but the appointment did divide critics. The more conservative reviewers had a problem with the topic of adultery being represented on screen. According to the Conversations with Wilder book, despite the critical division, it was accepted that Wilder's European sense of humor, that relied on self-awareness and his unique camera work, helped the apartment in redefining the romantic comedy, thus giving it a sharp edge and a more sophisticated look. The Academy agreed and gave Wilder Oscars for Best Director and Best Film. Years later, rom-com veteran Cameron Crowe believes it was the work of Wilder, which paved the way for the modernization of not only the romantic comedy, but Hollywood as well. All thanks to his bold ambition of breaking the rules of the old guard. Over the weekend, I hosted a TRT awards ceremony in Istanbul, which champions the best in screenplays. Nurse and I came along and filed the story. This is 12 Punto TRT script days. It's a screenplay festival of sorts for both professionals and amateurs alike. This year, filmmakers submitted scripts for 138 features and nearly 400 short films. For young directors and producers, winning not only means getting help to raise funds, but it also unlocks a network of industry professionals from around the world. And in the end, the aim is to bring more quality productions to Turkey. As for the awards, they were announced at a social distancing friendly location by the Bosphorus Strait. Turkish cinema is internationally recognized and its productions have been raising awareness on various issues. However, the support provided by the Ministry of Culture and TRT until today has not been enough to move our cinema to an even bigger place in the international arena. So, we've organized this project to provide further support. In the middle of a pandemic, many companies had to pull the plug on productions and go home. So then, what's the plan for the winners? Faruk Güven, the head of co-production at TRT, says, while they were crossing their fingers on a world without illnesses, it seems the winners will have plenty of time to film. All of the winners and all of the finals are their early stages of the project. It means that they have time for shooting. They will start their shooting probably next year or maybe 2022. It means that because we are choosing that kind of early stage projects in development, because we want from them to be in the markets, in the European film markets, to get funded. And we want from them to, to get some other co-producers as well. Because of that reason, they will shoot maybe in one year or maybe in two years. I hope pandemic will be, uh, will be solved at that time. Most Turkish films that receive nods from global awards are dramas. And some might say that the genre is nearing exhaustion. So I asked if this initiative would lend support to other kinds of films as well. Yeah, actually, as you said, yes, it's one of the challenges for art house uh, cinema sector. And we generally the genres in drama as well, but at the same time there are also some one one specific project which is, which is about uh, a dystopic dystopic world, and uh, there are also some epic epic ones as well, uh, which also uh, which is also from 11th century. But mainly, like as you said, the, the submissions uh, genre are generally drama. Drama or no drama. The night ended with content creators enthusiastic about the next step for their projects. Nursen Atutar, TRT World, Istanbul. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Head to our YouTube channel, Insta and Twitter accounts for more from the world of culture and the arts. Before we go, police have arrested and released a suspect in the Nantes Cathedral fire that happened on Saturday morning. We'll leave you today with the latest. I'm Elif Bereketli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.